Welcome back to Light the Fuse, the only Mission Impossible podcast that can take one interview and turn it into several weeks of yes. entertainment. I'm ready to push it. Let's do like a seven part. Listen, if you're telling me that if we sat with McCory or Bird for another three hours, we wouldn't turn that into seven <laughs> parts, you're out of your damn mind. But we'll take up three months uh, Yeah, with we'll a do it. ten minute interview with Tom Cruise. <laughs> But this week we're, we're back with uh, Charles Sotis here and yes, this hello. is Drew Taylor and we're back for uh, part two of Paul Hirsch, which we're so excited about because he's awesome. Our conversation was great, again, because of him, not because of us. And um, yeah, we're just excited to get this out there. Yeah. Um, and so again, always, as always, sign up for our Patreon. Yeah. Patreon.com slash light the fuse. Throw us a buck a month. It's always great. Or sign up for the the higher tiers and you'll get more bonus content like our commentary right. for the first movie. And every month we'll be doing another commentary. And uh, yeah, we'd, we'd love it if you would uh, help us out. It helps us. This is just a way for us to make this work because we're operating at a loss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are like Netflix instead of... Uh... <laughs> You know, actually producing anything of, of worth. It's just this co- podcast. But we want to talk about something that was on the Twitter that we put up from Ed, that Eddie sent us. Oh, yes. Which is an amazing chart of the action beats for each installment. Yes. And he, 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 he was, he said, he told us, he sent us this and he told us to credit his assistant editor, Hannah Leckie, for doing a lot of the work on this. So it's, they broke down every Mission Impossible movie, all six movies, by t- three types of scenes talking, suspense, and action. And it was, I think it was mainly they were doing the first five movies because this was in the process of editing the sixth movie. But I think they Fallout were doing is it in on there, though, too, right? Fallout is on there. Yeah. So I think they ended up getting a final tally of... So it's this little, like, waveform chart of, you know, when is it a scene of talking? When is it a scene of suspense? When is it a scene of action? And then it's, you'll see, like, you can... We'll, we'll post it on all our social media and you can take a look at this. And thank you so much to Eddie Hamilton for sending it's us this. It's so cool. He's the editor of Rogue Nation and Fallout. And now he's following us on Instagram. Did you see that? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you to Eddie for, for giving us this. And we will post it for all of you to see. It's a really cool diagram to look at. So um, we figured it would be good to bring up on this episode since this is Paul Hirsch, editor of the first movie and Ghost Protocol. And uh, we yeah, love so Eddie. We we love Eddie. So thank you so much, Eddie. And uh, let's listen to Paul. And be- yeah. before we do, just gonna tell everybody again to pre-order his book, uh, a long time ago in a cutting room far, far away, which yes. is obviously a reference to Star Wars, which he edited both Star Wars and we should actually, Empire Strikes Back. We should back. put a link up on our store or on the website so you can go through it, and then Amazon throws up us a few bucks if you order it through us. So Is that a thing that happens? Yeah. Sure. We'll it's an affiliate link. We're okay. put it up there. Let's do it. Uh, and then we'll be back afterwards uh, for some more stuff. So mm-hmm. come back. Well, he had said, to, when we talked to him, Brad Bird said that they did, after an initial screening, Cruz was like, and I think even executives were like, this is okay, we like it. And Brad Bird said, I like it, but it's not as good as it could be. And I want to do a couple more pickups. Do you recall this process? And like he said, they did like it was a very Ed Wood type situation where they were really filming very low budget version, like uh, inserts and, and close ups. I remember we had a, a night of pickups. Yeah, he said it was in a it was like in a dodgy area where they were shooting. <laughs> it was like he's like you would be surprised if you saw where we were shooting. Were you a part of this process? Yeah, I was there. I was falling asleep. You know, <laughs> well, I'm not I'm not used to night shoots, but. Um, yeah, we did some pickups, but that's normal. You always do pickups. Yeah. yeah. And you were on set for part of Ghost Protocol too, right? Yeah. Is that is that normal or is that was that a special circumstance? Well, if you're around, you always you get bored. You wander over to see what they're doing, you know. Yeah. It's not significant in any way. Okay. But it seemed like that one, that one took a lot to kind of pull together. Well, any of these movies that have a lot of visual effects, you're you're forced into this difficult position of having to lock sequences before the pictures even finish shooting. So you have to lock the sequence so the the VFX guys can start producing the shots and make the deadline. And it's always you must deliver fifty shots, you know, one hundred fifty shots a week from you know, and okay, and when are you going to deliver them? Well, we'll tell you later, you know, so. You're under operating under a strict deadline, but at the end they dump. You know, here's 300 shots on the last day. You know, and you don't have a chance to make changes, and you know it's a little unfair. But on these big VFX movies, you have to be there to lock these sequences. So 
Brad had to be involved with the cutting before the picture's done, you know? Right. Well, but you've had obviously a, a very long relationship with ILM. I mean, before ILM was ILM. With, well, with... I, I met them in their garage in Van Nuys. Right. So, <laughs> oh, wow. So has that, I mean, and John Knoll worked on the two Mission Impossible movies. You yeah. Did, right. So. John's brilliant. Yeah. Was, was there a shorthand there? Was it easier for you to sort of like trust that process or was it still sort of. Well, you know, uh, I mean, they know what they're doing. They don't, they don't need hand holding, you know. They, yeah. You get good people and let them do their thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, Brad was very particular, and I, I'm not so, what's the word, you know, I'm not so uh, controlling as, you know, micromanaging as he likes to be. Okay. In fact, I, I could save studios millions of dollars if I could institute a rule at their studio, and that rule would be, in VFX review sessions, no stopping on a frame. Right. <laughs> Millions of dollars a year are wasted stopping on a frame. Right. Wow. Because you're looking at an 18-frame shot that's going by in less than a second, and people stop on a frame and they say, what's that? What's that up there? You know? And it's just irrelevant. And When I worked on, on Empire Strikes Back... I met Ralph McQuarrie, who was painting uh, mats. He might even have been on Star Wars. He must have been on Star Wars. He worked on both. Yeah, it must have been on Star Wars, because I visited where he was working, and he had a sheet of glass that he was painting on. And he was able to light it from either side so that he could see the projected image that he was replacing. So it was... If the action was here and he had to build an environment around it, he could see what was going on in the middle and then, or in the one side, wherever the action was, and he could, you know, sort of figure out what he had to paint to cover up what they, what you didn't want to see and replace it with what you did want to see, you know, the landscape of Tatooine or whatever. And what amazed me watching him was how little detail there was in what he was doing. How little detail? How little detail. And I thought, my God, you can get it. And I said to him, you know, there's so little detail. He says, yeah, you don't need much. Because <laughs> you, first of all, we are hardwired to, to see movement. So if something is not moving, your eye goes to the thing that is moving. And your attention is drawn to where you're looking. So you're not looking at what's not moving. You know? So that was instructive. So I, I came away from that thinking, well, you don't need much detail. Now you go into sessions and... The, they fuss with detail all over the all over the frame, and you say, well, "They're not looking at that. They're looking at the guy swinging the sword." You know, <laughs> they're not looking at <laughs> they're not looking at the background. Or, you know, right? Well, speaking of detail, though, you were working on IMAX with IMAX footage, which has a crazy amount of detail. Was did that sort of present any challenges on your end of things? No, I've never been. I've never reacted to screen size. Okay, it doesn't make any difference to me. The my my work has to do with rhythm and the rhythm comes from the action and the action whether it's contained in a an image this big or that big it really makes no difference it's the rhythm of the action that that carries the day in fact you know if you're working on a small screen and you sit up close to it it becomes big you know so, <laughs> i mean you know if you sit in the back of a theater it looks like the size of a of an ipod yeah you, know, you know iphone right so screen size doesn't matter to me. What matters is audience size. Okay. You, know, you watch something alone, it's a whole different experience than if you watch it in a packed house with everybody howling. You know, this is why they put laugh tracks on TV. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a different experience. It's a social experience. Right, know? right. So it's not just uh, you and the stimulus. It's everything else going on as well. In the middle of, of Ghost Protocol... Yeah, the movie they went into production with a script, and we've talked to Brad Bird a little bit about this. Talked about talked with Christopher McQuarrie about this, and then in the middle of the movie, they sort of shifted it and changed it. And were you on the movie when this happened? Were, yeah. were, were you there when McQuarrie came on board? Yeah. And what was that like, and what was that about? Yeah, Brad was sort of thrown by the whole thing because they changed the name of the bad guy, and the, you know, the, <laughs> they, they, it was funny. Well, we figured out they had. Originally designed an elaborate opening action scene 
that involved intercutting between a, a snowmobile chase on a frozen lake and the action on a train platform and on the train. It was like, so Masita said, well, this is getting too expensive. We're going to cut the frozen lake. And now Brad felt like he had a you know, tripod with only two legs. You know, he, he, he didn't know how to. So he was trying to figure out how to make the opening scene work without the frozen lake, but it really never did. And uh, fortunately, there was a scene when Cruz gets out of prison, when he's sprung from jail, where Paula shows him an iPhone. And we use that as a way to trigger a flashback to footage that had originally been designed for the beginning of the movie. Right. And we played it as a flashback you know, a couple of reels into the movie, a second reel or whatever. Is that with the Josh Holloway getting killed and all that stuff? Well, you see that in the opening. Yeah. That's the opening, but you see the context. Of oh, it. right. Him, of him following the guy. And, yeah. yeah. See. Okay. And that had all been meant to be to go at the beginning, but it didn't work at the beginning. So right. we moved the beginning to the flashback uh, with this device of the phone that... And, was that uh, was that decision made in the middle of production or, or yeah. at the end, like late in the process? In, in, the po- in uh, we did. I, I forget. You know, at the very close to the end, we did some pickups in Vancouver, out in the street. You know, the last stuff we did was picking up these shots. That I forget exactly, but anyway, this is normal. And the, the, <laughs> and the decision was also made to to sort of carry <clears throat> carry Cruz through the movie because there was a lot of discussion. We understand about him not sort of being the same Ethan Hunt at the beginning of the movie. Uh, at the end, him having a different team or something like that. I mean, did you have thoughts about that? They were going to graduate him to IMF secretary at the end. It seemed like they were sort of trying to phase out Tom Cruise. No, I didn't. I was not party to okay. that. Mm-hmm. Okay. That seems like it was a big decision. We were we, we really above missed my, the... above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we missed the Brad was telling us about the scene where he's. There's a guy pumping a bad guy's heart to keep him alive for just a little bit longer in the script. Do you remember any of this stuff? It was stuff? Paula. Oh, they it was shot Paula. it. She they cut, shot it? Yeah, they cut this guy. She, she, um. <laughs> what? <laughs> Is it on the train? She's on the train. She beats up this guy. Oh, because oh, that's the, the knife. Off she, pulls out, yeah. she pulls out the knife and then we cut away. That, yeah, now it's that was, off camera. That was my contribution. I said, we're not going to show this, you know. <laughs> but he had shot. You know, they had shot her opening his chest cavity and reaching into his heart. And when you see her and she's going like this and it looks like she's doing something sexual to him. You know? <laughs> so, I, so we can't have this now. This is, uh, it was kind of, was it look kind of silly? It was a lot of laughter. There was okay. a lot of laughter in the editing room, yes. Okay. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, it sounds like a great idea in script form, but maybe difficult to execute. <laughs> okay. That's interesting. Yeah, it didn't didn't work. Would you work with Brad again? Sure. Okay. Yeah, he's fun. Yeah, he is fun. We love him to death. <laughs> and so Cruz was more in he was more in the edit room in Ghost Protocol. Uh Tom yes. Cruise. Yes. Yeah. And how was he there a well, lot? I mean No, how... I mean, you know, they the the most powerful players on movies get involved at the very end. Right. When it's about to go out the door, that's when they weigh in. Okay. And it's really the only time you really, they really need to. Yeah. Usually. Do you remember any contributions that that Tom Cruise had to either the first movie or Ghost Protocol? Things that he wanted to Well, I remember change? he came to see the picture uh, when we were working on uh, the first picture. And he came out of a screening and he said something about, he wasn't being critical or harsh or anything. He just said, I see you still have all the entrances and exits left in. And sort of a penny dropped in my mind. I thought, entrances and exits, interesting. Because, you know, the first rule of editing is cut to the chase, you know, get rid of the stuff you don't need. And I, you know, and I, I never thought about entrances and exits. And I thought, yeah, who needs an, and I started thinking, you don't need, you could just cut to somebody in frame. You don't have to have them walk into frame, you know. So this became an operating principle of mine from then on. Oh, wow. In all pictures. And I thought, well, why do you need, you know, occasionally you do an entrance or an exit, but, you know, it's usually unnecessary. It's more, it's a stronger cut if you cut to somebody in frame doing something as opposed to just walking in and then doing something. Yeah. So 
when they were talking about eliminating the editors from the Academy Awards, I started thinking about ways you could trim the show down. And I thought, why do you have to have all these entrances of these people in gowns and walking across the stage for 25 seconds? You know, they could just do a lighting change, have the lights come up on a, on a lectern and... You know, and now to present the next award, and they're already there. They don't have to walk in yeah. with the music playing. You know, and you know, then you could keep the editors on the show instead of. <laughs> I love this. I thought, you know, I thought, give me, give me a tape of the last last year's show. I'll, I'll tell them, I'll show them where the cuts are. <laughs> <laughs> they don't need, they don't need to eliminate, you know, editors and cinematographers from the show. Yeah. Like, what do cinematographers and editors have to do with filmmaking anyway? <laughs> Well, you talk about actors. Uh, was it you, Were you working on the fourth movie under the impression that uh, Vanessa Redgrave was coming back? I was hoping she would. Okay. It seems like the, it was in it production. Was just, I thought it'd be so cool. Yeah. yeah. But it didn't happen. Uh, I don't know why. Yeah, was, I thought that would be really cool. So were you cutting... That's why the guy on the boat is the same guy. That's yeah. what we were wondering. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you, you thought had, it was going to be... Her. Right, you had that scene shot assuming you were going to get Vanessa Redgrave, we assume? I don't know. I don't know the sequence of events, but I knew that for a while it was under discussion, then it fell through. And oh. it was, was, it, was it hard to reconfigure that? I mean, I know the the, no. the character of the fog and all that. The fog, yeah, the fog. He's not, That's he's, his name! He's not named in the movie, but Drew knows this because, <laughs> of, because of a Make Enough book. That the, the, yes. the arms dealer guy, who, yeah. who they... Yeah. Make a deal with, or you know, they he gives them information. He he's his character's name is the Fog. For yeah. those of you yeah, out there who don't know that, <laughs> <laughs> but there was an earlier. He had another name before. So I don't know. Anyway. Oh really? Didn't he? I mean, the I, arms dealer. They changed. I don't know about the arms dealer, but there you was, said so. Hendrix is the main bad guy, right? Did so you said Brad was found out that they changed the name of the bad guy. Is that what happened? Yeah, they. Yeah, when we rewrote, they had to reshoot when the idea of using the. The back of the van is flashback as a flashback scene. This is when Macquarie came in and he rewrote. It was over Christmas break or something. We stopped shooting over Christmas and he came in and he, he rewrote all this stuff and changed the name of the of the villain. <laughs> so Interesting. We, so there was stuff we couldn't use. I mean, they're catching crews up on what he missed while he was in prison, you know. So they reshot all that stuff with the new information, right? Because it wouldn't have made sense anyway. We 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 I I kind of like that that alternate opening that you guys did with him. It's a cool kind of, shot. Yeah, it's a really cool reveal of him kind of giving his speech about you know sort of assured destruction and all that, and you realize it seems like he's addressing a room, but then you realize he's, he's alone. He's practicing. Yeah, it, and then yeah, it's a, and then you realize he's sort of circling around him. I think the shot, and then he goes out. It's on the Blu-ray, right? Yeah. Did you did you cut for a reason? I see. <laughs> Were you a fan of that scene at all? It seems like it, no. if it no. could go, it, it went. Yeah, I, I wasn't a fan. Okay. No. <laughs> Who was that actor? I forget now. Uh, Michael Nyquist. He's actually passed away oh, yeah. since the movie came out. Yeah. Yeah. Has he? Yeah. He was only in his mid 50s, but yeah. He was you know, the... I said to Brad, I said, how come I can't understand? When you meet him around the set, he's perfectly, he speaks English fine. And in the movie, you can't understand what he's saying. <laughs> Why is that? He said, I know. And <laughs> it turns out that the dialogue coach or something had gotten to him and said, this character you're playing probably learned English in England. And so he would have an English accent on the... Oh. And so he was trying to do, instead of just speaking English with a Swedish accent, he was trying to do English with a Swedish accent with a, with a UK spin on it, you know? Okay. So... <laughs> That's bizarre. Oh, it was bizarre and too complicated. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, we have a question about the editing too that's been but, nagging on us that has not been answered by anybody. Okay, I don't know that I'll be able to. So there's a moment. Your curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> there's a moment when the bad guy, when the kind of uh, henchman is takes off a mask and it's revealed that it's the main bad guy, and it's very <laughs> unclear. Do you remember this at all? It's at yeah. the end of it's at the end of the <laughs> sandstorm sequence. Oh, okay. He's on he's on top of a truck and right. he takes it off. We we cannot and and no one has given us a satisfactory I, I answer. I think McCory gave a pretty good answer. He's saying Nick, that McCory listens to it. It's Nickvist on the. Uh, yeah, but why why is he dressed up as the the henchman? I can give you remember McCory said he's he's dressed up as the henchman because 
Ethan Hunt and the other guys are trying to get to Hendrix. But if they knew that that was actually Hendrix, they would just shoot him. But because they think he's the goon, the, the henchman, they want to get to the henchman to then get to Hendrix. And they can't shoot him. Paul? Because... <laughs> sounds, sounds good to me. <laughs> Okay. All right. Uh, case closed. I'll, I'll buy that. Uh, McCory talks about Dubai as the water, like the the high point of this whole series. That it's everything that he aspires to is because McCory now has made two of the Mission Impossible movies. He's making two more, and he says he's mad at Brad Bird, because, you know, in, in tongue in cheek that because Dubai, the Dubai sequence is so incredible. And I uh, just wanted to ask you about how that sequence was constructed. It's really, we, we saw a movie together in theaters and this, it was, we were cheering. I mean, it's an amazing Yeah, we saw sequence. the Lincoln Center IMAX, which is like one of the great IMAX screens. Yeah. Well, uh, I saw the last one. I thought that helicopter chase was <laughs> yeah. stupendous. I mean, yeah. and I love what they didn't show as well, you know. But I, I, I thought it was so funny. I mean, I just, the idea of chasing one helicopter and another helicopter. I thought, what are you going to do when you catch him? It's like (laughs) the dog chasing the truck. You know, what's he going to do if he catches the truck? I mean, yeah. And they answered the question. I thought, I thought that was great. It was just, when you say you, what they didn't show, what do you mean by that? Uh, I, I don't remember, but I remember they cut around like Tom is about to fall and, and then they cut away and they come back and he's, he's saved or somehow. Right. Yeah. He's like dangling from the thing. Without getting into, detail you know it didn't matter you know right stuff that didn't matter that people obsess about that you know i just thought it was very deft and i thought i thought it was really you know just just the idea of a helicopter chase was so funny inherently you know yeah well did you have a philosophy in terms of cutting that dubai sequence i mean were there sort of rules well brad had storyboarded the whole thing so it was pretty straightforward you know a, a, comp, a, a sequence that complicated has to be very carefully planned, you know. Yeah. And he had, I mean, I you know he and ILM had worked out the whole sequence, and they were sort of replicating shots they had already figured out. Okay. But then so much of it is practical. When you were watching, I mean, when those dailies came in, what was that? What were you surprised? I mean, he's cruises on one wire. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, I yeah he does stuff that I just I can't believe. <laughs> <laughs> there was a shot they did for a promotion that uh, I don't know if you've seen this but it's a helicopter shot of Dubai and there's there's the Burj Khalifa you know and you get closer the camera gets closer and closer and closer and it zooms toward you're getting closer to the spire and on top of the spire you see this little figure of a, <laughs> of a man and you get closer and he's you realize there's a there's a circular uh, ledge around a center column and there's a guy sitting on the edge of this little parapet and it's Cruz and he's barefoot and he's he's sitting there dangling his feet over the edge of the spire on top of yeah. the Burj Khalifa wow and the the camera finally gets close to him and um, it was a shot conceived by the production photographer who gave it to me to cut and I didn't know what to do with it because it's, what do you do with it you know it's right. this long shot and Cruz is sitting there grinning at the camera at the end you know I don't know how to cut that <laughs> I, mean, what, I, I have no idea you know so I don't know if they ever managed to do anything with it or not it's in we've the book we've seen the, a photograph of it yeah, yeah just well, of fo- him up close but I haven't seen the yeah. well, video footage well when it. you see it from you know half a mile away and then you Realize, you know, you don't even see him at first, and suddenly he's just dangling there. And he just <laughs> apparently he did have a harness on, and there was a stunt guy crouched down behind the wall, right? You know, holding on to the harness, but the harness could break, you know? yeah. Know. Yeah, but yeah. uh, Tom does some amazing stuff, he's he's fearless. Was he the one that brought you onto the mummy a couple of years ago? I'm sure he, if he hadn't wanted me on it, he would have said something yeah. <laughs> well McCory was on that one too yeah okay. <laughs> right, well, <laughs> the, um, no, I, so, I, I've known Sean Daniel for a long time oh Sean Daniel okay so you're talking about the, uh, the, the 
I working with like ILM had it all worked out a lot. The the Dubai sequence was it the same thing with the train sequence at the end of the first movie? You know the big bullet train yeah, finale. Was... I mean, it's a pretty amazing. I, I've heard that we've heard they, they they shot that for like six weeks or something. It was like a very involved process of getting those shots just right. Tom on the train, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had this. Uh, they had big sets, basically just big boxes draped in blue, and the only thing that was shot that was real in those shots was Tom. Everything else is replaced. Right. So they had these. Um, wind machines i think they were jet engines or something i don't know but they they exerted this incredible wind that would you know pull them yeah that stuff is so, place so and, good pull your skin back right? yeah all, <laughs> and uh that was interesting because they they would get like two or three or four setups a day because it was so complicated moving everything around so i was getting this is my first picture on on the uh, computers cutting on computers. And we started digitizing the video tap from the camera at lunchtime. And then I would cut it in the afternoon and Brian would come by at the end of the day and we'd figure out how to eliminate certain setups. So, oh, we don't need that other setup. We can just go from this to this. We don't need to shoot oh, this. Oh, setups that, had, that Island had conceived, preconceived? Or yeah. Whatever. Okay. So by, by using the video tap, it was, you know, black and white fuzzy footage but still it was useful just to see you know get an idea of how it would all cut together and then i'd have to recut it when i got the actual dailies yeah it was very uh it's funny to see how everything's changed so much so fast you know when we were working there if i wanted to work on real one and i think jerry was there and was working on something else and we had to we wanted to work on the same reel or something i had to they had to wheel in more drives. <laughs> they had to swap drives and right. disconnect this and wheel it into the other room and connect it there and you know. And then even on Ray, which is just like what ten years later, they had a rack of drives, you know, eighteen gig drives. It's like the, the biggest drive you know, we had forty eighteen gig drives. It's like this is amazing. You know? <laughs> and now you could fit it on, you know, you could put the whole, right. The whole mission impossible series on something smaller than that. You know? <laughs> so we learned a lot. We laughed a lot. <laughs> and, um, I oh, just love him. Yeah. I love him so much. I wanted to bring up, there was kind of a weird moment about the mummy. Yeah. When we asked about McCory's contribution, Listening back to the interview, my interpretation was that maybe Hirsch didn't want to say anything bad about the making of that movie. Yeah. Because the producer, Sean Daniel, is his friend. Right. So he didn't really bite when we asked him about yeah. McCory's contributions and stuff like that. I think he maybe didn't. It's, too, it's also a recent movie. It also could have been that he was just sort of brought on a little later. Maybe he, he wanted to underplay his own contributions. But right. certainly was probably asked to help out. And uh, I'm sure he did what he could. On yeah. That one. Um, and then also we found out that they actually shot Paula Patton pumping the guy's heart. Yes. In Ghost Protocol. But it sounds like it just didn't work. It sounds like it looked like a lewd act. Yes. If you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. So that's too bad. I, I would love to see that footage. Yeah. And I want to know if they did an actual makeup effect for it. Or, yeah. Or was it There's a lot of like implied? weird bodily things that were cut yeah. between uh, Peg's tongue and the, you know, right. all this yes. stuff. So. All right, so uh, here, here we, we go. go. Sorry, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, here we go. Ugh. Here's the ad. I want to tell you about another filmmaking podcast called Just Shoot It. It's hosted by two incredibly knowledgeable, charismatic, just magnetic directors that I can only aspire to emulate one day. It's not a lie to say that most of what I personally know about directing is from Matt and Oren's podcast, Just Shoot It. And please ignore all other podcasts, especially... Making Movies is Hard, a podcast about the everyday struggles of independent film or Respect the Process, a podcast about commercial directing hosted by a commercial director. Just Shoot It covers literally everything those podcasts cover and then some. If you care about the craft and business of filmmaking from how to sell projects to casting actors to designing the perfect shot list, Just Shoot It covers it all. So stop listening to this podcast right now. Type in Just Shoot It into your podcast app and get ready to have your filmmaking mind blown. Don't stop listening to our podcast, please. Don't do it. <laughs> I can't wait for June to be over because Jesus Christ. I'm sorry you have an ad on this show that you have to deal with, but it's a, a bet's a bet. We, we, lost, we lost, and, uh, you know, that's okay. So I just want to tell everybody to buy T-shirts. Yep. They, they support the show. It's a way of supporting the show, and your, you can... Support your chest. 
<laughs> support your cha- oh, there's also other things other than shirts. There's coffee mugs. That's true. Laptop cases. We have to put if we get if we get a sign off from Meredith, we have to put the picture of her and the baby up. Oh yes, I have a picture of my wife and our newborn, each wearing the Ethan and Luther and Benji and Ilsa shirts. Pretty great. My my baby's in the onesie. She's a little too big for her right now, uh-huh. so I'm waiting for her to grow. Okay. And then when she gets big enough, then she'll really be able to show off the onesie in a great way. Okay. But we, we we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, also, as always, sign up for our Patreon. It's patreon.com slash light the fuse. I mean, you know, you find a dollar in your pocket. Yeah. One, right about, about once a month. Yeah. Right? I mean, this is, you come across a dollar. You're like, oh, look at that. I found a dollar. You could toss it our way. Yeah. We would love it. Sure. We, we need it. <laughs> we... <laughs> or get the higher tier stuff and you get our bonus content, like yes. our commentary for the first movie. Yeah. And all kinds of other things. The extended interview with Robert Ellswood and, and other little bonus things that you'll get. So... Please, please, please sign up. It helps us. Thank you. And speaking of our Patreon, thank you to Jacob from Holland for helping us out. And this episode is uh, brought to you by Jeremy Dillon. And uh, it was also, as always, mixed by Luke Burson. So thank you all so much for helping us make this podcast possible. And we'll be back next week with the conclusion of our Paul Hirsch series. Thanks again for listening, everyone. And before we go, another mission, should you choose to accept it, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. And remember that you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at LightTheFusePod and email us questions or comments at LightTheFusePodcasts at gmail.com. If you'd like to watch the original Mission Impossible television show, all seven seasons are currently available to stream on Amazon Prime. This message will self-destruct in five seconds. 